Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're talking to a man who is one of the primary forces behind Low and Slow Barbecue in Victoria. Hey family, hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. In today's episode, we've got an absolute legend of the Australian barbecue scene and particularly in Victoria, we're talking to Glenn Dumbrell from Cha Cha Cha, uh, one of the most famous and OG low and slow butchers in Melbourne. Now, before we do get into that, I do have a couple of announcements that I need to run by you. The first is I'd like to thank and welcome Jagged as our podcast partner for today's episode. If you're out there and you're looking for a new uh, smoker oven or gravity-fed cabinet or you've got a custom uh, kitchen install that you need done, reach out to Jagged, hit them up. They do some great stuff. I've got one of their smokers out in the backyard now and it is built to last. So do make sure you check them out. They're over in WA but they ship nationwide and they're great people and they do build a great product. Now, if you are listening to this and or watching this and you're at the beginning of your barbecue journey, jump on over to smokinghotconfessions.com. We've got our free ebook available for you, The Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. That is a great little book. It's been internationally awarded and it's free. It's got everything you need to know to get you up and started in this delicious world of low and slow. And woo. And if you are joining us today uh, from the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue community on Facebook, you're tuning in for the for the live recording of this episode with Glenn. Welcome and thank you very much. And if you're not there yet, do ju- come on over to Facebook, jump on the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue community. It's a great group. It's all just about barbecue. It's family friendly. We leave all the guff at the door and it's just a really nice place to hang out. Now, if you're watching this later on on YouTube, do give us a thumbs up, a subscribe and hit that little notification bell. On Facebook, it's all about the likes, the comments, and the shares, particularly the shares. If you've got a friend who you think is going to like this episode, make sure you shoot it through to them as well. You can send it in direct message. Did you know that? You can do that. It's pretty cool. If you're on IGTV, we'd love a cute little love heart and a follow. And if you're on a podcasting app later on, particularly if it's Apple Podcasts, five-star rating is great. It really helps us out a lot. And it has helped us get to number six on the US podcast charts for food in the last 30 days and number three in Australia. So thank you very much for that. It really does help us out. We really do appreciate it. Now, as I said at the top of the show today, we do have Glenn Dumbrell. He is one of the longest serving low and slow butchers in Melbourne. He's got a cult-like following of people that just love him, love his products, love his shop, and he supports many of the big teams down there, and his Facebook group, The Wolf Pack, has nearly 8,000 people. So for a branded barbecue group, that is just massive. But he's got some great stories, he's a really good guy, and I think it's time we get him in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast. With your host, Ben Arnott. How long's it been since your last confession? Hey, Glenn, welcome to the confessional, my friend. It is great to have you. G'day, Ben. It's a privilege to be on such a good show. It's um, been one of my bucket list things. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much. Oh, all righty. So, man, tell me, what was the last thing that you barbecued? The last thing I barbecued would have been last weekend. A tomahawk. Oh, yeah, right here. I do a few tomahawks. It would have been, I would say it would have been a black onyx tomahawk, and we did it in the pit barrel. Oh, nice. Do you hang them in the pit barrel? We did. Put a drill hole through the middle of the bone and hang it, and normally cook it over uh, mallee root charcoal because I like how it, when it renders, how it keeps chucking smoke back up. And, uh, yeah, good fun. Yeah, right. I've I've never actually cooked on, on Mallee root before. How do you find it? Oh, I like it because the first barbecue I got was a was a Komodo Joe. And um, I don't know, back then there probably wasn't a lot of fuel around and um, I, I just like the smell of Mallee root and the flavour. It's, yeah, it's good. It's beautiful. Interesting stuff. I think it's, um, it, it's sort of specific to South Australia, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it might be. From the Mallee, I, I guess, yeah. It's pretty red, readily available down here. It's everywhere. All the char- places use it as well. So, you know, it's $30 for a big bag, so it, it's good. Yeah, it sounds like great value. 
Mate, so what is your, your favourite thing to barbecue then? It, is it the tomahawk? Uh, probably my favourite thing to eat would more than likely be a lamb shoulder, just a square cut bone in lamb shoulder because, I don't know, I think as far as Australian barbecue goes, that's probably our, our signature that we've got different to the States and I think that it's underrated lamb and it should be in the States. And, um, yeah, I love it. We've got saltbush dorper lamb all year round from South Australia and it's just gorgeous. So, yeah, that's probably my favourite, to be honest. Yeah, that, that, that saltbush dorper has a fantastic uh, reputation. Oh, it renders really well. It's sort of, it's not really, the flavour isn't strong, a strong lamby flavour. It's a real subtle thing and it's, um, so the rubs and that you put on it are sensational. Like, Tree bark's just amazing, and so is um, Heavenly Hell's um, Lamb Almighty. Those two, I think, are the best combination you can get. Yeah, the Heavenly Hell stuff is just incredible, isn't it? He's local here to me on the Gold Coast. He's on he's on my bucket list to get him on the show. <laughs> he's the best label maker I've ever seen, and his products, are, the range is so big, but every single thing's good. Amazing. He's a he's a freak. Yeah. <laughs> in the in the nicest possible way we mean. Most foody possible way. He's just he stuff's amazing. Yeah. No doubt about that at all. Yeah. So mate, you've been uh, you're you're a butcher. You've you've been a butcher yep. for, for several years now. Tell us about how you got into that. Originally I got into butchering, um I grew up in Bomb Beach in Victoria and uh, I had a best mate and his brother became a butcher and then my best mate became a butcher, then I became a butcher, then their little brother became a butcher. It was just, I don't know, we just sort of fell into it, to be honest. Uh, none of us had butchers in our family and um, we all played footy and butchering was pretty physical back then and it sort of sort of kept you fit and you had fun and, you know, we liked food. So, so I don't know, we just sort of fell in it, to be honest. Yeah, and I guess uh, if if you're playing a lot of footy, then having access to all that meat to uh, to bulk up and stuff would have been handy as well. Yeah, well, we didn't have to train because I mean, back then the turnover we started in supermarkets and there was nothing to bone out fifty four quarters of beef on a Monday morning, so we were pretty fit. We really didn't have to train; it was good. <laughs> you're just getting paid to train, really. It was good fun. Would have been back in the days before all the all the rotisserie hangers and things, and you had to actually go pick it up and carry it around yourself, and then put it on the hook yourself, and uh, and then break it all down into pieces from there. Yeah, there was a lot of lifting, although um, we didn't do much boning on the block because we started with Safeway, which are now Woolworths, and um, they bought in the yeah they boned on the on the rail, which is sort of American thing, I think. So there's plenty of lifting. Yeah, I mean you'd be lifting lambs, you're doing. You might do 50 sides of lamb at a time, so you'd be lifting a, you know, 15 kilo lamb onto the saw one after the other. So, without knowing it, you were, you know, you were training. It was good. Yeah, yeah, sounds great to me. So, in that in that time, well, okay, um, how how long have you been involved in, in butchery? Oh, it's funny. I um I did my apprenticeship, and then I left and went to work at uh, other places because I wanted to work at butcher shops because they didn't make sausages. So I wanted to learn small goods and that. So I moved around a bit. I bought a little shop in Chelsea Heights and I sort of um, I, I sort of introduced really good food to the, um, to the suburbs. But it was probably the food I liked and I was in a working class suburb. I was working my guts out and I, um, I thought, I don't want to do this when I'm 50. This is too hard. So I actually got out for 16 years and I... I went into the pharmaceutical industry and I um, I've worked for a big place called Fordings, which are now Pfizer, and um, we manufactured cancer drugs for 16 years. So I mixed drugs, I filled drugs, I, um, you know, I, I managed groups of people and uh, a whole lot of raft of things. But in that time, I, I just loved food. So I'd, I'd say I was a foodie as much as I'm a barbecue, which is a funny sort of a name, Foodie. I don't love the name, but um, food's always driven me, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, totally. So you, you sort of did a full circle there. You did the full lap. I did. And um, my partner, Maria, she's, um, she was a legal secretary. She'd had a liver transplant and she had a sort of a lifelong dream for having a cafe. And I kept talking her out of it. And I, I actually got a package while I was working at the pharmaceutical place. They went offshore. I was working part-time in a butcher shop um, and studying. I was studying counselling. And um, Coles did a refurbishment out the front and they sort of come and talk me into doing their dry age stuff. And I wasn't going to stay in the butchering, but Maria kept wanting a cafe and I kept talking her out of it. In the end, she said, why don't you buy a butcher shop? And I thought, well, I'm going to go broke in a cafe. I might as well go broke in a butcher shop. <laughs> At least I, if I do, it's my own fault. So we bought a butcher shop. And so a legal secretary and a bloke who hadn't been a butcher much in the past 16 years bought a broken down old butcher shop in Parkdale that was that close to going broke. It wasn't funny. And um, completely changed the way that sort of they do stuff in butcher shops, I guess. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay, cool. Now, you, you, you mentioned that you're quite into uh, small goods and, and dry ageing. Is that sort of what um, your, where your passion lies? Not really. Um, dry ageing, I don't mind it. Um, I, I just I – don't, I don't love dry ageing everything. I think it's a little bit confusing, dry ageing. I think people are dry ageing stuff that shouldn't be dry aged, so I sort of – Prime safe, the regulatory body in Victoria make it a bit hard too. So, but small goods, yeah, we make our own cabana, our own ham, our own bacon, um, and I pimp up a lot of cabanas. I make a, um, I make a brisket beer and jalapeno cabana that everyone goes mad for. I make a chicken chili cheese. I made a uh, cherry ripe cabana the other week that had sour cherries and coconut in it. So. Yeah, look, that's an outlet. I'm creative. I, I, you know, I do a little bit of writing, so I'm pretty creative. So I don't do things normal. So I'm always looking to try and find something different. That's probably where barbecue is a good outlet for me. I dare say so. Yeah, yeah. For for those that are listening and watching that aren't familiar with dry aging, could you give us just a bit of a quick rundown on the process? Yeah, dry aging is um, you've got to dry age in a specified a cabinet that's um, specially made, take the humidity out of it and everything. And it's um, the whole idea of dry aging is to break down the muscle, which happens after a couple of weeks, all the muscles start breaking down. So that gives you tenderness. And it also takes moisture out of it, which sort of make, gives you more flavour. It's sort of like making stock, you know, you boil stock and you take the water out and it gets stronger with flavour. Same sort of thing. And... The thing with dry aging, in my opinion, between 28 days and 30 days, it's at its very optimum. After that, you sort of, you know, you can dry it out or you can ruin it. And um, But people dry age stuff that isn't great quality to start with. You're not going to dry age something that's great quality, uh, that's not great quality and turn it into great quality. But if you get really good, sort of um, Angus beef or something and dry age it. It'll have a beautiful sort of a truffly sort of a flavour. It's, it's sort of a funny thing, dry aging. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but, um, you know, it's all right. It's like craft beer. I, I, I'll I, drink a different beer every week. So I might have dry aged stuff one day. I might have a Wagyu the next day. I might have a, you know, a, a barley-fed wanderer the next day. So it's, yeah, I look at meat like craft beer. <laughs> yeah, nice. Sense. Sounds great to me. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've I've noticed when I've been looking at at people's photos on Instagram and things of dry aging that the the outside of the meat kind of goes almost black. Do you do you need to cut that off before you start cooking and eating it, or or, or do you just eat through it? No, no, you cut that off. That's all waste, and that's why it's so expensive. But some people some people put that into hamburgers and they'll mince it up, which is really dangerous. It's um. It's wasted. The outside's wasted. It's um, you can actually um, you can cover them in butter and dry age them if you want to. That's another way I've seen people do it. But general, normal, everyday dry aging, you um, you cut that outside out and you throw it away. 
is that like a bacteria buildup thing? Hundred percent. Yeah, it's full of bacteria. Right, but some people put that back into hamburger patties. Yeah, so I've seen people on online mincing it through stuff, which is a bit dangerous. I, I know you cook it. I know you're cooking your meat to a certain temperature and that, but it's dangerous. You um, dry aging isn't something that um, you want to do without doing a lot of research because you can get sick. So you've got to be careful. Yeah, it, it sounds like something that would be uh, quite quite easy to, to get wrong. Yeah, look, when you really think about it, dry aging is something butchers have been doing for hundreds of years because what we used to do, you get a body of beef and hang it for a month. And that, that, that was a term that butchers used to use. It was hung. And really, hanging meat's dry aging. But, Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's primitive, just like barbecue is primitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious too about what you said about um, if you start with a better product, you end up with a better product. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't something like maturing a lower quality product give you something better? Why, why does that make a difference? A lower, a lower quality product isn't going to – you're not, you're not going to get much flavour in it. Like you, you buy like yearling beef or something that's, that's cheap or and, and nasty, it's, it's still got to still gonna be a good quality product to start with if you're going to dry age it. You just can't turn a, you know, a sow's ear into a silk purse. It's, it's as simple as that. You, and, and that's everything that – that's my mantra is that I don't get anything that I don't really, really like. And I don't know, cheap and nasty doesn't work. It's, um, it's cheap for a reason. And if you dry age really cheap lean beef, you're going to end up with something that's really, really dry. And it's, it's just not going to be nice. Yes, yeah, so you're going to turn it almost into jerky. Absolutely, yeah. And it's, it's not going to have much flavour. It's going to be chewy. And you're going to have wasted a lot of, of, a lot of refrigeration, a lot of time and a lot of meat. And, and it's just got to start with something good. Just, you know what, rather than get something really big, get something smaller but better quality. You know, and that's the way I eat. You know, I don't, um, I'd rather small portions of good food. I dare say there's a lot of us out there that could probably do with following that advice. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, yeah. Myself included. Yeah, barbecue can do that. Huh? I, had, uh, I had one customer who used to eat that much Wagyu. He had a heart attack and I had to ban him. Ooh, wow. For a little while until he, till he got fit and then I let him have it again. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'd I'd imagine his wife would have uh, would have appreciated that. Oh, probably. He's a bloody good cook, though. Acelia, you've probably seen him online. Oh, right. Yeah, he's, yeah. He does some amazing stuff. Oh, uh, he's um, he's probably been our most interesting customer over the journey because he's a terrible photographer when he started. <laughs> and, and good cook, but he's turned into. A, Amazing cook and a, probably a, just as good a photographer. Really good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that I'm really uh, interested in, in now that Low and Slow has really kicked off here in Australia, is how that has changed things like boning specs. Because I know that, um, that there's a difference in boning spec between Australia and the US. So could you give us a bit of a chat about, um, about how you've seen the, the industry evolve since Low and Slow became a part of our uh, culture. It probably hasn't changed much in Australia as far as boning spec because they still just bone according to how we want it. But with um, what's also Australia, where because we export so much to Asia, a lot of and we we export a lot to the Arab Emirates and that as well. So a lot of the spec of the stuff we do is more suited to Asia. So you might you know, decals and things like that. Um, so it's the specs probably, I, I don't know if the boning specs have changed. If they have, I'm not aware. But the um, what does frustrate me is the um, the different terminology, like like a T-bone. <laughs> In America, a T-bone is called a porterhouse. 
you know, and um, there's all these different words and people come in and, and ask for something and, well, thank God you can Google and I'll say, bring a photo in, I'll tell you what it is. And um, like the first time we had a pit master come in, Chris Marks from Three Little Peaks. Yeah, yeah. And he come in and he said, uh, can I have a Boston butt? And I said, mate, I don't know what a Boston butt is. But I said, I've got a pig there. <laughs> and <it's> got <laughs> So I'll push the pig out and you tell me how to get it off. And um, he talked me through it and, and I did it for him. And see, in Australian terminology, a Boston butt is a square cut shoulder pork with the cage bone and the rind removed. You know, you tell any butcher that, you'll be able to work it out. But if you walk in at most, well, a lot of butcher shops say, I want a Boston butt, they wouldn't know what it was because it's not even a butt. Is it the, the Boston butt? The terminology comes because they used to put them in containers called butts in Boston and ship them all over the place. So it's not even a butt. But um, terminology is confusing. But as I said, with um, Google and that now, it's you, you can work it out. Bring in a cookbook, show us um, another one, flat iron steak. I think we call them oyster blade. You know, there's there's lots of different terminologies. That's interesting, yeah, because the, the flat iron steak is, is quite a hot cut at the moment, but I remember oyster blade growing up was always kind of a lower-end steak cut. Always incredibly underrated and um, a bit like the hanger steak, you know. We, hanger steaks, um, we used to call them body skirt. And another thing, or butcher's cut, and that's another thing. It was butchers and good cooks knew what it was, but now everybody knows what it is. and. As they do know what it is, it all becomes more expensive. Now, the things that were expensive, people aren't eating as much and they're dropping off. So I suppose everything in the world's supply and demand, isn't it? It is, mate, for sure. Yeah, yeah. We are. Um, I was just chatting uh, with, with somebody this morning and they were talking about when they first got into uh, barbecue, a whole brisket cost them $29. I went, what? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I get that all the time too. Someone will say, oh, brisket, you know, you used to mince it and throw it out, but but it wasn't like a, a you know, a, a black onyx brisket that's been gen genet genetically engineered for so long and fed a certain amount of grain over a certain amount of days and, you know, the amount of time. You know, what we pay for different products is completely justified because the amount of time and effort that the producers like Cape Grimm and Black Onyx and all them put into it is just amazing, which, um, you know, I really take my hat off to all those producers. They really make life easy for us. If you're looking for your next barbecue smoker or grill, Jagged Wood Fired has got what you need. Owners Julianne and Glenn are multiple award-winning barbecue competitors who have even travelled to the US to compete at the World Barbecue Championships in Houston, Texas. Based out of Perth and shipping nationwide, Jagged is one of the largest pit builders in the country and has an ever-growing lineup of meat cooking machinery. Not only do they have their now famous smoker ovens, their incredibly efficient gravity-fed cabinets are proving extremely popular in commercial settings, and they also make some of the most stylish asado grills you're ever going to see. Jagged is also well known for amazingly detailed custom work ranging from backyard designs all the way to installations in commercial kitchens. Proudly Australian designed, owned and manufactured, you can find out more at jaggedwoodfired.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D Once again, head to jaggedwoodfired.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D to learn more. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. All righty, Glenn, now we're into segment two now and I want to sort of spend a bit of time sort of diving into Cha Cha Cha. Now, the first thing i got to say is that is a very cool name. Putting the word Cha in the name just screams barbecue. Now, I, I think we sort of started to get a bit of the origin story of, of Cha 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 and I think wh where you left off was uh, you and your lovely wife had just bought the uh, – 
the the old broken down butchery was was what you said. So we'll sort of start from there and and sort of continue the story of Cha 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 from there. The butcher shop we bought which came up right in Parkdale. It's a Bayside suburb. It's a really nice suburb, but it was a Cambodian couple had it, and um, I think they got it because it was close to the school that they wanted one of their kids to go to. And uh, as it turned out, it, it just wasn't suited to the Cambodian style of butchering. It's very, um, very Anglo, and they have really lean stuff and whatever, and it just didn't work. So I I knew it had been a really good butcher shop previously, and a, a bloke called John Rickson had it, and he won the um, Sausage King Award. And so it had a bit of um, history about it, the shop. And it's got a, like a tin sort of stamp roof and a, it's it's 80 years old or 100 years old, the building. So it had wow. a bit of, yeah, a bit of character. So it, it was sort of perfect for what we wanted to do. I wanted to um, – I, I read this book, um, Primal Cuts. It's, it's an American book and it's called Cooking with America's Best Butchers and it highlighted a butcher from each state and um, – how they'd survived through supermarkets and everything else. And they all had a point of difference. And that's where it's sort of barbecue come in. But I didn't want to be called Parkdale Quality Meats. I thought, you know, you know what I thought? I thought, I'm sick of chefs take still on the thunder with all these great names. And I thought, <laughs> why can't we? And um, so I said, how about I call it the lazy cow? And... Um, <laughs> my, my daughter and Maria and everyone said, if you call it the lazy cow, no women will want to shop there. <laughs> so, so I took that on board. So I'm throwing ideas around and, I don't know, cha-cha-cha just come to me and, uh, and amongst a whole lot of others. And um, just like naming a kid, you know, when you name a kid at first, not everyone likes it, but eventually it becomes them. And cha 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 said, I think it's a great name, a great brand, and it's it's become something which has been, you know, it's been a labour of love, and we work a million hours a week, but it's we've had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, Hands yeah. Today, you know, so it's been different. Yeah, yeah. I love the fact that it ties in the idea of the of the cha cha, the dance. It's the it, it it's the dance of yeah. passion. You guys are passionate about meat, you're passionate about cooking. And then C H A R as in char for cooking. And then because yep. one of the things that, that that butchers do is they, they give a whole lot of cooking advice. So that that that's what really stood out to me about the name. I just really loved it. Oh beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So how long have you been there now? We've been there nearly six years. Nearly right. six years. Okay, so you would have been around sort of at the sort of same time that the whole low and slow movement was, was kicking off. I was, and um, when we started doing it, we were sort of the first shop in Melbourne to have a range of short ribs, a range of briskets, and that's where brisket beer and jalapeno cabana come. You know, I'd have a heap of brisket. If I couldn't sell them, I had to turn them into something. So I just, um, you know, I do everything a million miles an hour, so I just... I do what I want to do, so I bought in what I like, and and it just worked. But um, you know, we were early, and um, I think the Yaks Festival were the first people to come and get us to do something on stage. I um, did a barbecue comp against a few butchers, and I had a meet and greet with greet with them with um, Myra Mixon, which was good fun, and Mike Johnson, and then Jay Beaumont come along. He must have noticed us online, and um, he sort of come and grabbed us and did a few things and, yeah, so um, that's why you've seen us so much, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say that you've um, you've been quite uh, involved with um, several of the Butcher Wars that, that, that Jay puts on. Give us a bit of, a, bit of an idea of what Butcher Wars is all about. Yeah, well, Butcher Wars, Jay's grandfather was a butcher. That's where his passion comes from. Oh, right. Yeah, and he, um, he's a ripper bloke and he does such a good job. Butchers Wars, they first thing I did for them was a demonstration. I demoed a pork ribs. And um, I met Shannon Walker and I jumped on stage. And I had to do some Louis ribs and baby backs. And I did them. And I hadn't, I hadn't been on stage. And I did them. 
And I think I had about 25 or 30 minutes or whatever, and I did them in 15. And he said, mate, you, you've got to keep do some more. I said, well, finished. And he said, well, it goes for 30 minutes. And I said, well, you should have told me beforehand. <laughs> and it only takes me 15. I could talk for 15. But but then that happened. We got on really well. Um, I think they come and did a little promo in the shop with Tuffy Stone. And um, Tuffy came into Cha Cha Cha. And I, I said to the butcher there, as I, as I said, I was a foodie, like a food lover, loved barbecue. But I wasn't really, um, I didn't know, I was doing Long Slope for 13 years before I knew it was American, you know. And um, I jumped on, I, that's right, Tuffy Stone was coming in. I said to my butcher, I said, oh, Jay's coming with some Tuffy bloke. And um, he goes, not Tuffy Stone. I said, oh, I think that's his name. And uh, he goes, <laughs> he's a legend over in America. And I said, oh, okay. And he turned up and uh, nicest bloke you'd ever wish to meet. And I've sort of got a friendship with him now. And he'd come up and we went out the back and sat down and talked for half an hour. And he was more interested in what we do over here. And um, so that happened. Jay did a really good video. I think it got 20,000 hits in a couple of hours, which was pretty good. Um, then I sort of started doing the Butcher's Wars with them and they got me to do a little bit of emceeing and which was good fun and uh, got to meet a lot of young up-and-comer butchers, which I really I really enjoy the passion that these young guys have got because one of the reasons I got back into butchering was because I didn't want to see our trade go by the wayside. And um, I could have got other pharmaceutical jobs, earned more money, done it easy, an RDO every fortnight, but I really didn't want to see our trade go by the wayside and I wanted to sort of put something into it. And Jay come along... Shannon come along, all the crew that they've got with them, and we've done some really good things together. And um, Jay's sort of meat stocks, other than the madness that's been going on the last couple of years, meat stock has been an enormous part of, of Australia's barbecue journey, and it will continue to be later on down the track. But it's given us a lot of opportunities, and it's given us a lot of really, really good fun, fun times. Yeah, definitely, no doubt about that at all. Now, I'm I'm curious about what you were saying about um about uh, when you got got started. So, was Cha 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 was that a a low and slow butcher from the start, or was that something that you sort of you saw the trend coming and went, hey, this is something we really need to get into and and get behind. Well, we um, I read the book about the Americans and saw there was a point of difference in every shop that has survived, but. Not all the same point of difference. They're all different points of differences. I bought a Komodo Joe ages and ages and ages before I bought the butcher shop. I bought it online. I don't even know if they're available over here. And I was doing low and slow. I had my children for five years on my own. And, um, I've got a son and two daughters. And I was cooking low and slow. And we were having a ball. I was cooking chucks on the bone. And, you know, how good's this? And... Uh, when we went in the butcher shop, I wanted to do low and slow. So it wasn't a business plan. It was just what I liked doing. I wanted to introduce other people to it. So it just happened to be the timing was perfect, but um, it wasn't planned at all. So <laughs> I was on that time too. I, I had um, Adam from Manhorn, um, Adam Speakman. I talked to him online, he had smokers for sale that he was making in his garage. So I went and met him in his garage. I had a look at his smoker. I come home, I thought, I want to get a smoker like that, but first off, I want a commercial smoker because I want to make cabana and ham and that. So I rang up at him. I said, look, sorry, mate, I'm not going to get it this time. I'm going to go with a commercial one. We struck up a friendship. He came in, got his meat office. He had a barbecue team, which won uh, Burley Heads. They, they were great champions at Burley Heads. Uh, he came and got all his meat off us, chucked in the back of a trailer, drove all the way up to Queensland and won a comp. So that was exciting. And that was they were the first team to, to win with us. He introduced me to another bloke, um, Daniel Barrett. Um, Daniel invited me around for dinner. I think that was the first time we'd had really fed income American barbecue. Daniel had been in a little team. I think he was 
don't even know if he's a team member in a comp, hadn't started Big Smoke. He started Big Smoke. We started, he started getting stuff off us. He was working with us one day a week. I taught him butchering. He spoke to people about barbecue. So um, then he went and won the Australian title, which was pretty amazing. I had, I had uh, Dan Greenwood coming in. We were given, we were sponsoring him. He had tree bark. I said, hey, how about I sell it in the shop? So I was selling tree bark in the shop. I was the first one to sell that. Him and Jeff, big Jeff, went on and won um, the State Cook-Off Association ring. So I would imagine we're the only shop in Australia that sponsored the ABA winners and the State Cook-Off winners. But all these little things just evolved. There was no planning. It was just, we just met really good people along the way. And... Um, and they were having fun and we were having fun and, and they, they've all made something out of themselves. I mean, Daniel does it for a living now. Um, tree bark, I think, was for sale in Texas at some stage, which is a pretty amazing thing to sell a, a lamb rub in Texas. Definitely, yeah. The, the lamb isn't, isn't sort of super high on their menu, so to be able to get a rub <laughs> in there is a pretty good achievement. It is. Now, something that I did see on your website when I was doing some uh, some research for this is that um, you are big on free range, organic, local, and ethical. And so, yep. I just want to ask just a couple of questions on that. Um, could you tell us a bit more about those four elements and why they mean so much to you? Free range, um, all our poultry is free range. Obviously, all our lamb's free range. All our beef isn't because barbecue doesn't allow you to have. You've got to have some grain fed stuff. Um, all our eggs are free range. Uh, we sell lots of little tiny products off little local producers. I, I like dealing with farmers because just like I wanted our trade to keep going, I want farmers to keep going. I don't want, I don't want us to turn into America where everything's frozen from a great big conglomerate, you know, because I think we've got the best meat in the world and, and with American barbecue, we've, we've got the best barbecue in the world, you know. <laughs> now it's uh, it's we're taking we're, we're good at taking other people's things to another level and i think that's what australia's done with barbecue but getting back to farmers like we had a pork farmer who was really really struggling uh, so we had a fundraiser for him and and we we raised five thousand dollars this guy I, i'd get pigs off him once every now and again but our group the wolf pack raised five thousand dollars to keep their family farm afloat and we've done lots of things like that that we don't really spook about or carry on. But we, we've got Limestone Porks, another little operator, when, um, when all the restaurants closed down in Melbourne and they were struggling to sell it all, um, they reached out to us. Now, now we get Limestone every week. Our, our lambs come from the Clare Valley in South Australia from a, a little farmer. Yeah, it's been like that since day one. And I like to know where our stuff comes from from because I like to tell customers where our stuff comes from and I like to know where my food comes from. So it's sort of the shop's taken on the personality of what we like and it just happens to be what a lot of other people like. Yeah, I think that there was, um, that there was a lot lost uh, when sort of supermarket uh, sort of started doing all their own butchery departments and so the the the, the traditional butchers kind of missed out a lot there and the the small local farmers started to miss out and i think that uh, yep. that the emphasis that you put on that is great because it kind of it, it's bringing that uh, as you said you're sort of reviving an an older profession and bringing a lot of that back and um i'm, I'm curious to know specifically what you consider to be uh, ethical butchery like what what's that about Ethical butchery, to me, is, is to know exactly where it come from and to know that the animal came from a really good background, had a good life, you respected it and sold every single bit of it. And, um, you, know, you know, killing animals isn't ethical no matter which way you look at it. And, you know, you can, you're going to have your vegetarians and, and your vegans and they've all got a, a platform and there's all this fake meat coming out at the moment, which tastes like rubbish. And it's, you know, you can talk about as much as you like. As far as I'm concerned, humans are the head of the food chain and we, we didn't fight our way up the food chain 
to eat tofu. You know, we, we fought like... <laughs> Now, look, the strongest cavemen are the ones who survived and the ones who, who ate apples and oranges wouldn't have beaten the ones that were eating other eating dinosaurs. You know, it's simple as that. But I think we need to be as ethical as we can. And um, strangely, I don't, for, for instance, I don't have any veal in the shop. You know, I don't like it. And, and I know veal's normally from the dairy industry and, you know, it's a byproduct and everything else. I just don't like the idea of of cutting up young animals. But um, I I look at, at meat as like a carpenter would look at a piece of timber or something. I don't look at it as an animal. But if I can do my bit to, um, to put some money in the pocket of local farmers that I know are doing a really good job with their animals and love their animals, um, you know, why not? You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. All righty, so now we're into uh, in, into segment three. This is our, our part of our uh, of our episode where our guest gets to impart some wisdom and share some thoughts with our viewers and our listeners. So, mate, over to you. You're going to talk to us about um, meat and selecting different barbecue cuts. Very important information. Yeah, look, as barbecue evolves, um, I'm getting more and more families coming in, more and more, actually more and more young guys. Like, it's nothing for a 15-year-old guy to come in with his mum and be looking for a brisket because he's just been watching it on TV. He probably might have been watching your podcast. He's been watching Pitmaster, you know, because it, the food channels are big and, and it is a big part of um, the food culture now. And... You know, they'll say, oh, I want a brisket. I want to first cook. I, I don't know what to use. What should I use for me? I don't want to spend too much money. I, I, I might just get a cheap brisket or I might just get a cheap cut of meat. And there's lots and lots of different ways to start off your barbecue journey. For instance, a uh, lamb shoulder is pretty foolproof. Um, pulled pork, you know, a collar butt foolproof. But beef, if you want to do beef, a lot of them want to use briskets and um, if you're going to go for a heart, a, a really, really cheap brisket for your first go, you're more than likely going to bugger it up and you're, uh, you're going to be disillusioned because at the harder, the, the better quality it is, the easier it is to cook. So I would sort of suggest if you're starting barbecue, go with a tri-tip or a rump cap or something that's not so big, you know, it, it's only going to feed four or five. Uh, don't waste your money on a cheap brisket. Don't go to um, one of those big chains and get a really, really cheap one and a half kilo chunk of brisket. You're going to be sitting there for 12 hours and wondering what's going on and it's going to be shocking. So um, I, I just think probably um, get a good relationship with your local butcher or maybe two or three butchers if you want around your way. But, but I think that's really important because, um, you know, our customers, so many of them I know personally now, and uh, they might say, look, can you get a Brahma hump? And I'll source a Brahma hump. If I can't, I'll tell them, if I don't do something, I know someone else does, it might be goat or whatever, I'll point them in the right direction. But the same as all food, you know, it's probably good to to uh, go to the market and, and form a relationship with your fruiterer. I, I know my daughter goes to the... Dandy Market, she only goes to the one fruiter every week. Might not be the best one, but she's got a good relationship with them. And um, I, I think meat selection, do your homework um, and start off easy and work your way up. But rather, a smaller, really good quality thing is better than a big, bad quality thing at the same price. That would be my advice. Yeah, very good, mate. Um, you were mentioning before about how uh, some of the different steak cuts have different names. I've been running around the Gold Coast in the past looking for tri-tip, and I had to go to 17 butchers before I found one who knew what I was talking about. Is there another name for tri-tip that I should be using? I don't think there is. <laughs> oh, okay. Tri-tip is a thing that's strangely really big in San Diego. So I don't know why it's, that's where it's big. But I, I would, I would probably think it might be 
left from the rump cap, like you, you take off a rump cap, you've got the tri tip on the other side. It's probably a byproduct of uh, of rump caps, but um, it's only a tri tip. I think a rump tail might be another name, but you won't. A rump tail is only going to be small, so I don't think there's another name for them. Picanha and rump cap are two different names, but tri tip I'd only know them as one. But oh, a lot okay. of interesting. Don't know much about them as yet. It's it's not something that's – we sell a lot of them now, but um, it's not something that everybody knows about, I guess. Yeah, right. Interesting stuff. Now, I'm just going to swing back to what you're talking about, about um, selecting different cuts. What should people be looking for when they're looking for a brisket? If you're looking for a brisket, you can either go grass-fed or grain-fed, or you can go Wagyu, um, Wagyu Black Angus. What I look for is marbling. Marbling to me is um, the most important thing with beef. Uh, grass fed's more likely to have less marbling. Grain fed's going to have more marbling. Uh, grass fed's got a cleaner flavour. Um, grain fed's got a more buttery flavour. But uh, marbling, um, a thick flat, you don't want a flat that's going to um, taper right off because if a flat tapers right off, you're going to have trouble keeping that moist. Well, they can always trim it back and use it for some of it for burgers. Um, yeah, look, a good fat covering and good marbling, uh, a good high point. Uh, it's one of those things you just can tell when you can see it. And um, watching, watching really good barbecuers and, and teams come in and buying a brisket is, um, is a thing in itself. You want to see them. They're just oh, amazing. We had Big Mo Kaysen come in just before meat stock. He got all his meat offers for meat stock. And he took an hour to look through the briskets. And he off he went with all his stuff. And um, then Melbourne went into madness the next, the next day and he had to fly home to America. He didn't get to cook. But uh, that was, <laughs> watching him pick a brisket, oh, it was like he was, his life depended on it. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd imagine it's like when you go to the, uh, to the green grocer you were mentioning before and you see those people and they're like, they, they want to buy five apples so they'll pick up 60 apples and like yeah. sniff the apple and put it back and then the next one. and Yeah, yeah. But with meat, um, they've all got different ideas. You know, they've all got their different ideas and I guess that's why, you know, they're, they're all different levels. I, I know Tuffy Stone cut, hand cuts his wood. Every bit's exactly the same. So they're clever. Definitely. Now, pork ribs was was another one that, that I wanted to talk about because uh, everybody wants to be able to do pork ribs, but uh, a lot of people find them to be quite difficult. And my suspicion is that, it because, is that it's because they're not selecting the right rack of ribs at the start. So tell us, for barbecue, what should we be looking for for pork ribs? There's a really big difference between good and bad pork. You don't want lean pork. Um, that's where the brands come in. It's... Um, that's what, what's made our life so much easier. Like, for instance, um, Borrowdale, um, nearly every con every team in Australia that's cooking are using Borrowdale ribs. Their meaty ribs have got just a nice cover on them. I mean, St. Louis ribs, if, um, if you buy St. Louis ribs off a butcher in Australia, you're pretty much buying a uh, pork belly with the rind off. A real St. Louis rib, you need that next layer of meat taken off, but they're not going to take that whole seam of meat off because what are they going to do with it? They want to sell it to you. But um, look, stick, find a brand and stick with it because if you're just going to get, if you're going to buy random pork off a, off a butcher, you, it's going to be different all the time. If you find a brand that you really like, and my favourite brand's Borodale, um, our whole pigs we get, we get St Bernard, which are brilliant, and we get Limestone, which are brilliant. They're two great breeds of pork. But the mass-produced stuff, Borrowdale, just find a brand and you'll know when you see it. It'll have nice little fine marbling through it. So to, to wrap this up, can you yep. give us a bit of a, uh, a, a uh, behind-the-scenes, bit of a, a scoop is the word I'm looking for. Can you give us the scoop on what, because uh, you work with a lot of the big barbecue teams, what, what brands and cuts are popular with a lot of the big barbecue teams? You don't need to name the teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mayara Wagyu brisket is really, really good, brilliant. Um, 
Seven Creeks is another good one. Um, there's one that I won't mention because they won't sell it to me. Um, <laughs> fair yeah. enough, fair enough. Hook, Borrowed Ale, um, Spare Ribs, Beef Spare Ribs, Cape Grimm's really good. They have a four plus. They're four plus grass-fed ribs. Tuffy Stone looked at them and he said they can't be grass-fed. They are. They're grass-fed. In Tasmania, they've got, they got um, butter grass, which really makes it really, really marbled. It's amazing. It's a unique product. Um, yeah, what else would they be? Lamb. Look, lamb or saltbush dorper, there's no real brands. Uh, there are some brands, but most saltbush dorper just, they come off the farm. And not a lot of people sell stuff that's not really dorper. Um, if you want to know if it's really dorper, ha have a look at the lamb. The legs have to be really short and stocky. If the legs are short and stocky, they're dorpa because they're a South African breed. They're bred for their meat, not for their wool. That's that's oh. what's um, and they eat saltbush, which makes gives them and takes a bit of the flavour into them. Um, but they're about the main ones. Um, rubs and sauces. Um, Heavenly Hell get a fair go. Tree bark gets a fair go. Jess Proles as uh, stuff goes well. Four sourcemen from New Zealand. Um, there's one meat stock there, has won everything you can think of over at SCA over in New Zealand. I bring them in from New Zealand, so <laughs> so I'm going to plug them, but they're amazing. They really are. Um, look, there's Johnny Max Rubs, Big Boy Barbecue, Lance Rosen. Lance Rosen's one of the greatest barbecues in Australia. Um, yeah, so look, Rubs and that are important. Lanes are good. You, and and you got to layer them, you know. You get your own, you get your own combination. Don't just use the one rub. So um, there's some interesting stuff around, but most of them use the same stuff. A lot of the teams help each other out a bit too. They're they're pretty friendly with their advice. They don't tell you everything, but um, but rubs and that are the most important. And Australia is, if it's not leading the way in rubs and sources, I'd be pretty surprised. I think it's it's pretty good. We started yeah, we off. You know, one or two from little small producers. Now all of our stuff, you know, Jackalope's another one from Queensland, which is an absolute ripper, and I'll probably leave some out, which I, I don't want to. BRZ, you know, um, Andre Adrani, who I went to uh, Brazil with, his stuff is amazing, you know. All right, look, that's a good point for us now to start wrapping up this uh, th this episode. So I'm going to throw the studio over to you. Give some thanks, give some praise, give some shout-outs to people who've helped you and make sure you tell all the viewers and the listeners where they can track you down on the internet. Yep. Yep, we've got uh, Wolfpack Low and Slow is our barbecue group, which I believe is the nicest barbecue group in Australia. We've got nearly 8,000 members. Char Char Char's um, Camo Parade Parkdale. Um a shout out to to Jay Beaumont, to Shannon, to um, you know Lance Rosen, all the people who've helped me along the way, and Paul Mercurio is another one who was on earlier. We've we've just got so many people that have helped us. Uh, my family have been brilliant. Yeah, you know, Maria, Tara, uh, Danny, my uh, butcher who breaks for Melbourne. I hope he's disappointed on Monday, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, look, I could. All the guys who went to Brazil with, Adrian, Adriano, um, you know, another Mike, uh, Mike Johnson from the States is good, sugar, sugar Fire. He's probably one of my best mates in barbecue. He's, uh, he's amazing. I find barbecues like that. There's so many, you know, like-minded people that we all get on really well. Just like you, Ben. I mean, what you've done for barbecue is enormous and uh, you've, you've given us a lot of professionalism, which I really appreciate. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. That's about it. All righty. Well, in that case, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. I realize it's a Sunday and I, I do appreciate you taking out some, and it's, and it's your day off as well. So uh, I thank you very much for your time and I look forward to finally getting back down to Melbourne and I'll come in the shop and say hi in person. My pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And there you have it, family. That's Glenn from Cha Cha Cha. How good is that guy? He is an absolute legend. He has been at the forefront of the low and slow movement in Victoria for pretty much since the time that it started in Victoria. So, uh, you know, he's, um, oh, what would you say? He's a, he's a, 
one of the founding fathers, I guess. Would that be a would that be too much of a stretch? I don't know. Anyway, it was great to have him here. And as I said, I'm looking forward to getting down to Melbourne. And the next time I get there, I'm definitely going to go in the shop and go say hi. And I'm going to try some of that brisket sausage. That sounded absolutely amazing. Now, that is almost all the time we have for today. So before I let you go, I'm just going to give you a quick reminder. Big thanks to Jagged Woodfine for being our podcast partner for this episode. If you are looking for a smoker oven, for a cabinet smoker, for a custom job you've got in mind, hit them up. They're great people. They do great work. Um, if you, we've got our ebook available for you on the website, smokinghotconfessions.com. It's the beginner's guide to real barbecue. It's got everything in there you need to know to get started in low and slow barbecue. And if you have been here with us today, mate, thank you very much for joining us in the Facebook community, in the Smoking Your Confessions Barbecue community on Facebook. I've loved seeing all your comments and questions come through. Uh, we're still getting a few coming down here now, even though we're on the wind down. Someone there is excited to see me come down. Uh, someone else has had a great time here today, so that's that's really nice. So if you would like to be a part of the live podcast recordings, do come and join that group. Um, it is the uh, one of the nicest corners of the internet to come and play and just hang out and talk about barbecue. Now, if you are watching this on the socials, please do all the, all the social niceties, all, all the social sharings for us, the likes, the comments, the shares, the, you know, tell somebody about the show. That really helps us out as well. And those five-star ratings and reviews, particularly if you're listening on an Apple uh, product, an iPhone or an iPad right now, those are super important. We really appreciate that. But yeah, that is about it for today. So until next time, Take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>